lovely Calimaris, this is Calimara here. Welcome back! Or if you're new to the channel, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. I want to welcome all the new Calimaris that have just subscribed and I'm really excited that you're here. We just hit 50k. I can't think of a better way to start 2022 and I'm so excited to see all the places we will go together. And speaking of traveling, as of writing the script, I'm actually in hotel quarantine. I edited and posted my last video while I was at the airport because I arrived so early to do my rapid test on the day. There's a whole story there in and of itself, but I'm not going to bore you with the specifics. All I will say is that I've arrived safely in Jakarta and I'm very happy to be able to see my family again. The video topic we have today came highly requested. Chloe Bourgeois. She's a rather polarizing character, mostly for the fact that she was intended to be the show's appointed mean girl and bully to the main protagonist, but ended up being more well-liked than the main protagonist herself. If you watch the show, you probably know why, but if you don't, I'll fill in the blanks for you as well as give you my own takeaway of it. As you might have seen from the title, this video is a collaboration with the extremely talented Pimika Mew. She reached out and offered to create a fully animated transformation sequence for this redesign and I am completely blown away by what she came up with. So please be sure to watch all the way to the end of the video and subscribe to Pimika Mew's channel because she is amazing at what she does and it would be so cool if we could show her some love and support, especially if you love Miraculous Ladybug. For some context, Chloe Bourgeois is one of the main antagonists in the show. Her father is the mayor of Paris, who is also the owner of the most luxurious hotel in Paris, and her mother is an internationally renowned fashion critic. She's not necessarily a villain like Hawkmoth, though she's gotten close enough. Chloe alone has caused a lot, if not most of the akumatizations in the show, and has been akumatized herself like four times, but there's something about her that just makes me hesitant to truly call her a villain, which I will get into later. For my redesign, I know I wanted to change up Chloe's regular outfit because I showed her character illustration to my mom and my sister, and they both said that she looks like an unmarried middle-aged woman. I think this is mostly the fault of Thomas's dated knowledge on fashion trends because no one has worn blue eyeshadow and nude lipstick since the early 2000s, which is presumably also the last time Thomas cared about fashion. And before you say that the show is set in the early 2000s, the characters have smartphones with touchscreens. Those didn't even exist yet. Thomas just isn't a very fashion conscious guy, which is super ironic considering he worked on Totally Spies, a show that was all about three very fashionable girls who saved the world in style. But Chloe's fashion sense, despite being fabulously wealthy and having a parent working in the fashion industry, is really nothing to write home about. No wonder her mom called her unextraordinary, am I right? As someone who really wants to stand apart from the crowd, you would think she would go for bolder fashion choices. Something with more flair that would turn heads if she walked down the street in it. I wanted her to look like she rides in a yacht at least once a week and attends exclusive fashion shows regularly. I wasn't quite sure how I would communicate that at first, so I started by putting her in a sassy but high fashion pose that makes it seem like she's turning around to judge you for trying to talk to her. I really wanted to emulate iconic mean girl characters like Regina George and Heather Chandler in this redesign, where you hate them, but you still want them to like you. I knew I wanted to put her in some platform heels because it makes her seem more grown up and sophisticated. But aside from that, I wasn't sure what to do for her actual outfit. That is, until I saw her costume in Queen Banana and it was love at first sight. Chloe looked absolutely stunning in her skirt and her hat with her hair down. I didn't realize Chloe could look that good, so I knew I wanted to incorporate those elements in my new design. 
I truly loved her frilly skirt and I thought it would be a nice addition to add some flair to Chloe's outfit. I didn't want to do that exact skirt and while I was mulling over possible designs, I remembered the flairies from Barbie A Fashion Fairy Tale because yes, I do watch Barbie movies, what of it? I've always loved Shine's dress and I knew right away that that was what I wanted to do for Chloe. It's flashy, extravagant, and kind of gaudy, which I think is perfect for Chloe. I also experimented with Glimmer and Shimmer's dress styles, but it wasn't quite the look I was going for. Oh well, you live and learn. I also decided to give her tights underneath for safety, keeping in mind she's still only 14-15 and we don't want any upskirts here. For her face, I tried to follow her original features as much as possible. I noticed that Chloe naturally has sharp, sultry eyes and a prominent cupid's bow, which is this part of the lip. She also has a very distinct heart-shaped face, which is a short face that is wider at the forehead and cheekbones and slims down, ending in a pointed chin. I wanted to keep these unique features of hers while also updating other things like her makeup because, well, Audrey might be justified in thinking Chloe is a disappointment otherwise. Later on, you'll see me giving her a gold smoky eye look because it's a bit more on trend these days, as well as a glossy pink lip instead of a nude matte one. I didn't necessarily want to water her down and make her seem more friendly or approachable. Instead, I went in full force and gave her the most intimidating glare I could. Like, if looks could kill, you'd drop dead right there and then. Oh, fun fact, when I started color picking to color in her eyes, which you will see later on in the video, I realized that she actually has the exact same eye color and gradient as the Guardians from Breath of the Wild, which I think is extremely fitting because they attack with lasers that they shoot out of their eye as well. I added her hat, which is a chic sun hat that I think makes her look really posh and stylish, and I decided I would keep her hair down to let her show off her freshly styled hair every single day. And of course, to complete the look, I also gave her a chic, likely way too expensive handbag. That's also how I would rewrite her personality. She's still the vicious mean girl that bullies people just because she can, but she would actually have the charisma to emotionally manipulate people into admiring and fearing her. See, one of the major insights we learn about Chloe in the show is that her mother, Audrey Bourgeois, is one of the main reasons she is the way she is. Audrey is a very vain and narcissistic person. She's good at her job, but she's a horrible mother. Chloe behaves the way she does because she wants to be like her mother, who she believes is an outstanding person. So she copies her to try and earn her approval, attention, and to a certain sad extent, so she can avoid punishment. This is demonstrated perfectly when Audrey, akumatized into style queen, threatened to turn her own daughter into a gold statue until Chloe convinced her to let her be her assistant, her accomplice. If you think Audrey is only saying that because she became eviler as Style Queen, literally a few moments ago, she also tried to fire Chloe as her daughter because she didn't like the wrapping paper Chloe chose for a gift she gave her. That's just how she is. Chloe outright states that the reason she was so nasty was to be like her mother so that she would like her. Because in the end, the only person whose approval Chloe really craved the most was Audrey's. Of course, we'll never really know to what extent of her selfish, entitled, rude, vicious personality is nurture as opposed to nature, but even then, the current Chloe is a pushover when it comes to being the big, bad, scary bully, since no one is really scared of her and the whole class is against her. I would say that she's more of an underdog than Marinette is, because everyone rallies behind Marinette and gangs up against Chloe. And Marinette is supposed to be the average everyday girl that is supposed to be relatable to a lot of the audience. 
That just makes all the times when Marinette is being mean to Chloe and pushing her away and brushing her aside when she's Ladybug really frustrating. It's like watching someone kick a puppy or steal candy from a baby. Because of that, I want Chloe to be an actual threat as Marinette's rival. The Regina George to Marinette's Katie, so to speak. Maybe this Chloe is a skilled event organizer from planning and organizing her mother's fashion shows ever since she was young to try and be of use to her and earn her approval. Maybe she regularly organizes events at her father's hotels to bring in more guests as well and runs her own event planning business where people hire her to organize high-profile events. And with so much at stake, she's impatient and a perfectionist with little tolerance toward people who fall short of her standards and she has no issues telling people how she really feels and what she thinks of them, even if it hurts their feelings or because she just wants to be nasty. It also makes her catchphrase make a lot more sense in context because she's constantly screaming RIDICULOUS! UTTERLY RIDICULOUS! She just treats people the way she's treated by her mother because she probably doesn't know any better. So oftentimes, she sees other people as little more than just servants or assistants that are only there to do her bidding. She's known all throughout Paris to hold the best parties and events. Everyone who's anyone attends them, and if you want to be invited, then you had to be on her good side. And if you aren't invited, then you're pretty much an outcast. Maybe her father is even a major contributor to Francois Dupont College's funding, which means Chloe gets to be in charge of organizing a lot of school events, and if she doesn't like you, then she can actually make your life a living hell. At least, temporarily. Aside from her father's influence, this also gives her classmates a valid reason to fear her wrath. On the flip side, she also likes offering invitations to high-profile events to her classmates as leverage to get them to be nice to her and obey her. And if she comes to one of your parties, then you're pretty much one of the popular kids in Paris. I find it shocking that Chloe has never thrown a party to get people to like her before Despair Bear, because if there's one thing rich teenagers like to do, it's flexing their parents' money on their peers. I think these two aspects combined would make an effective play to get people to clamber for her approval. On the one hand, if Chloe likes you, you get to go to her parties and events and get on the news and get lots of clout. But if she dislikes you, she can make your life utterly miserable. So when Marinette runs against her for class president, I want her to lose. Because although she makes a good speech and has good intentions and principles, Chloe is popular, famous even, and she has the money, throws the best parties, and people are too afraid to defy her. And be honest, if you were 14, who would you rather vote for? I think that would also establish Marinette's role as the well-intentioned underdog against the tyrannical ruler. This creates an actual power imbalance where Chloe actually can bully Marinette. I think it would be a fun touch if Chloe constantly forgets Marinette's name the same way she never remembers her butler's name. Because not only does it show that she thinks Marinette is about as significant to her as a butler, but I think it would also make us feel better when Marinette manages to win the day. Because we're rooting for her. I can just imagine one of the ways that Chloe bullied Marinette growing up is by constantly telling her that a guy likes her and then laughing at her when she approaches them and gets rejected. Maybe she even pulls an actual Regina George where she finds out that Marinette likes Adrian and tells her that because she's childhood friends with him, she'll be able to set them up. But when the promised day comes, she tricks Adrian into a date and acts romantic and flirty with him knowing Marinette is watching. Or maybe she purposefully throws a party on Marinette's birthday and invites everyone in class but her to make sure no one shows up to her birthday party. And the next day when Marinette confronts her about it, she goes, What? I didn't know it was your birthday yesterday. Why didn't you invite me? I totally would have come. I'm sure your party was an absolute blast though, right? Oh well, maybe next year. Dude, 
I would live for that kind of drama. At this point, if you've never seen Miraculous Ladybug before, you're probably wondering how real Chloe is faring in the show, or if you're an avid viewer of the show, you might be wondering about my takes on how Chloe is handled as a character. And unfortunately, it's not great. Similar to Adrian, Chloe came from a broken home and a dysfunctional family. But the main difference between Adrian and Chloe's upbringing, despite both coming from extremely wealthy and famous families, and the theory that Adrian was a senti monster all along, is that at least Adrian's family was functional for a time. Chloe's parents were separated by choice and whenever they were together, didn't exactly get along very well. Mostly because of Audrey. Heck, Audrey literally had a child with another man while she was in New York, while she was still married to Andre. On top of that, neither of Chloe's parents were really in her life. Chloe was basically raised by her butler. Unfortunately, Chloe also idolizes her mother, which might be why she's so misguided. When I first started the series, I absolutely hated Chloe. She was so unpleasant and her actions always seem to cross a line every time she's on screen. Whenever she opened her mouth, I wanted to skip her entire dialogue. And I genuinely wondered how people could possibly say she's their favorite character. And don't get me wrong, I didn't hate her because she was mean. In fact, the only times I did like her was when she was being mean to Marinette. Because she actually deserves it. But then... I remember that Chloe was purposefully written to be annoying and unlikable and easy to hate. So in that regard, she's actually fulfilling her role very well. If you grew up watching Totally Spies, then you might know who Mandy is. Mandy is the high school bully that antagonizes the main characters of that show. Sound familiar? Mandy is essentially Chloe to a T. She's rude, mean, petty, arrogant, completely spoiled by her dad but has a harsh mother, and she lives to make the protagonist's lives miserable. Fun fact, Chloe, Sabrina, and Alex were originally supposed to be a trio as a reference to Clover, Sam, and Alex, the main protagonists of Totally Spies. And the parallels are pretty clear. Chloe is the blonde, boy-crazy, vain, girly girl, Sabrina is the nerdy redhead, and Alex is the short-haired, sporty girl. So, I guess that would technically make Marinette Mandy. Interesting. But anyway, because I grew up watching Totally Spies, as soon as I saw Chloe and how she acted and how she gets treated in the show, I immediately knew what Thomas's intentions were with her character. They needed an intentionally annoying, dislikable character that the main character can best, so to speak. It's intended to be cathartic because the main character gets validation that they are superior to their bully and reaffirms that they are in the right and they are the person you should be rooting for. But the main difference between Mandy and Chloe is that Mandy is never implicated to be anything more than just an entitled, whiny, mean girl. She didn't have crappy parents or a hard home life, she's just the way she is because she wants to be. And you might think that that makes her more one-dimensional than Chloe, and you would be absolutely correct. But she didn't need to be anything more than that. That was what made her effective as the annoying bully. Mandy was fun to hate. And she even went through a similar arc to Chloe where, for an episode, she also became a spy like the main trio, got removed from the role, and simply went back to being Clover's high school rival. But the reason this works is because Mandy herself hated being a spy. She was annoying the entire time she was on the mission, and she kept sabotaging it for the girls, and she also just didn't like being on the missions and fighting bad guys and risking her life to save the world. By the end of the episode, she was so traumatized by the experience that she not only voluntarily had her memory erased, but insisted that they do it. And that's fine. That's great. We know exactly where we stand with Mandy, and I appreciate Mandy for what she is. 
a fun to hate yet ultimately harmless antagonist. But where it's fun to see Clover show Mandy up or see her get her comeuppance, you just feel bad when it's Chloe. And that's because Chloe has been shown to be more than Mandy. Chloe was competent as Queen Bee, and was never anything but cooperative and welcoming to Ladybug. She had her role forcefully taken away from her, even though she loved being a superhero and she loved helping Ladybug. And arguably, Marinette really led her on when she kept summoning her to be Queen Bee after the first time she returned her miraculous. which. Doesn't even make sense, because the reason Marinette decided to never call upon Chloe to be Queen Bee again was because her identity was public knowledge when it had always been public knowledge from the start, and yet Marinette still used her. So if this were really the case, shouldn't she have stopped after the first time Chloe got her hands on the Bee Miraculous? It's completely hypocritical. So, the reason why Chloe is a worse off antagonist than Mandy is because Chloe has shown the potential to become a better person. Yeah, she's awful, but she's young and she had a bad upbringing. So, maybe she can change if given the time and patience. Heck, she was one of the only characters to be able to resist being akumatized, which shows us that she has incredible willpower. The tipping point of Chloe finally agreeing to help Hawkmoth at the end of season 3 was because her own parents were akumatized. If there was ever the right time for Marinette to give Chloe the Bee Miraculous, it would be that, wouldn't it? But she didn't. And yet, they completely forget that her parents were even akumatized in the first place and only fixate on how Chloe decided to help Hawkmoth because she was upset at Ladybug for not letting her save her own parents. It's almost like victim blaming, and you even see the same tone on the Miraculous Wiki, especially in their documentation of events on Chloe's page. like. I genuinely think that whoever made this entry must have had some sort of grudge against Chloe because listen to this. When talking about her in the episode Heart Hunter, they noted that Chloe got upset at being passed off by Ladybug in favor of a different heroine, not because she wanted to save her parents who, mind you, were the two people that got akumatized in the first place but because she is just being entitled and has grown too possessive of her powers and that Chloe couldn't be a hero because she didn't understand selflessness, that by giving up her powers, she would protect everyone in her life from Paris's villains when the only time the people in her life were actually affected was after her powers had been taken away by Ladybug and she was powerless to do anything about it. Chloe wasn't even Queen Bee anymore, but her personal life still got attacked. She only became the Miracle Queen because Ladybug passed on her and Hawkmoth took advantage of that fact. There are more instances like this, but I'm not gonna go too deeply into it because I'm probably biased at this point and I want you guys to draw your own conclusions. But this is my personal conclusion. Call it a different perspective or the benefit of the doubt, but maybe Chloe is the way she is because she's trying to keep her mother in her life. The only times she has been shown to bond with Audrey was when she realizes that Chloe was just as nasty as she was. The fact that Audrey does end up liking Chloe more for being so nasty may be the reason why Chloe stays nasty throughout the show. It's not that she likes being mean or that she wants to be hated, but maybe she believes that if she lets that attitude go, then maybe that's the equivalent of letting her mother go. So although the show and writers would label Chloe as a villain, I don't think I will ever be able to see her as one. She's just a girl who was neglected by her family and failed by the people she looked up to. She was misguided and scorned, but she still tried to do the right thing from time to time. She could have changed, but the show writers just didn't have the patience to see it through. And I think the biggest reason why the season 3 finale was such a disappointment to many viewers was because the writers failed to follow the principle of Chekhov's gun. This writing principle states that details within a story or a play will contribute to the overall narrative. 
This encourages writers to not make false promises in their narrative by including details that will not ultimately pay off by the last act. All the elements were there for a good redemption story, but what was given instead was a villain origin story. So yeah, people were kinda mad about it. Of course, if Chloe had become a hero, that would make her the single most complex and well-developed character in Miraculous. But instead, they abandoned her, make her even worse than before, and then they replaced her. So, if you guys are subscribed to me, then you would have seen my Queen Bee design in full already. So, make sure you subscribe if you want early access to these designs. But, my design choices received quite a bit of skepticism. Um, so rest assured, I will be giving my full explanation and reasoning for them right now. The original Queen Bee outfit is the standard Miraculous style skin tight spandex suit and honestly, aside from the patterns, there isn't much to it. One could even argue that it's almost identical to Ladybug's suit because in my opinion, it was intended to be. If you guys remember, Miraculous Holder suits are based on their individual wants and preferences. We know that Chloe idolizes Ladybug deeply and wants to be her, so it makes sense that her costume is heavily reminiscent to Ladybug's. Her weapon, a spinning top, even functions in a near identical way to Ladybug's yo-yo. Of course, I want my Chloe to be her own person, so we're going to be doing something kind of unorthodox. We are taking her queen concept and dialing it up to 11. I knew right away that I wanted to give her some fluff because fun fact, bees are covered in fuzz. It helps flower pollen to stick to their body so that they can pollinate other flowers when they drink its nectar. I wanted her fuzz to look like a luxurious fur coat to give her an affluent aristocratic look. And I wanted her to have wings as well because it would set her apart from the designs I've done so far. And because I saw a tutorial on TikTok on how to create a crystal effect and I really wanted to try it out. Uh, and because I thought it would suit Chloe as a character too, of course. The small sparkly wings were an homage to Winx Club, which is a magical girl show I was obsessed with growing up. I was particularly inspired by Bloom's wings, as its general shape was quite reminiscent to real bee wings. I was informed by someone on my Discord server that bees wings don't actually flap up and down, but rather rotate to keep them afloat, and because of this, they're situated more laterally, meaning Chloe's wings would need to be located more on the sides of her back than directly on her back, which worked well because I imagined her wings to sprout from her extravagant fuzz, which would situate it more outward. For this design, her mask was heavily inspired by masquerade masks, particularly the kind that also covered the nose, to add to that feeling of opulence. I gave the edges of the mask an angular shape to complement her eyes, but that ended up being obscured by her hair. Of course I kept her ponytail and curls because I genuinely loved that about the original design and I intentionally shaped the ends to look like stingers. Later on, when I colored in her hair, I decided to give it a brassy undertone similar to my design of Chat Noir because I knew I wanted to do an ombre of dark brown at the ends to hammer home the stinger idea and it would blend the colors better. But the biggest conflict I had for this design was actually what to do with her bottoms. See, Initially, I planned for her to stay in her skin-tight spandex-like outfit with only the addition of her fuzz, but then I saw this costume design, which was so regal and effective that it made me really want to go for a skirt, because I could use it to create the illusion of a bee's abdomen and stinger. But the conflict I mentioned before actually lies in the practicality of the design. How easy would it be for Chloe to move around and fight in a form-fitting skirt, even if it's made from stretchy material that can slide? I could go for a shorter skirt, of course, but I thought it would take away from the silhouette and regal feel of it. So 
I kind of landed on a compromise where her skirt design has hidden slits at the sides to allow her legs free movement and ends in a point to maintain that silhouette. But if this Chloe has wings and can fly, I really wanted to take advantage of that and explore the possibilities it would bring. For instance, maybe she doesn't really need to jump around and perform acrobatics. Maybe this queen bee wouldn't be a melee fighter at all. After all, there's no point in a team where all the members do the exact same thing. Heck, there already is a character that predominantly plays a support role and stays out of combat. Rena Rouge. So I thought, why not make Queen B a ranged attacker and since we were talking about totally spies before, have her specialize in espionage and scouting. Her spinning top can work as a ranged weapon, where instead of it being held in the fist and delivering venom as a punch, she could just throw it out of range and strike targets with venom that way. Plus, the Heroes Wiki states that using her top, Queen Bee can travel much faster than Ladybug and reach destinations quicker than other Miraculous holders. Sounds like a good way for her to make quick escapes or move between locations quickly perhaps to gather and relay information to her teammates. And being able to fly would also mean that she could be the group's eye in the sky, keeping track of enemy movements and intercepting with her ranged weapon where necessary. So she doesn't even need to be on the ground or near the center of conflict at all. Because of that, I thought, fuck it, I'll go full wings club slash totally spies with her and give her some heals to complete her prima donna look. To assist in this role, I thought it would be a good idea for Queen Bee to have worker bees, which are similar in concept to the swarm she conjured as Miracle Queen, except their only function is to allow Queen Bee to see and hear what they're seeing and hearing, effectively letting her scout an area, listen into what the enemy is saying, and keep track of their enemy's every move from a safe distance. After all, as a queen, she doesn't need to be the one getting her hands dirty or messing up her hair. With the intel that Queen Bee manages to gather on the enemy, she's a valuable asset in beating them to the punch and stopping them before they get a chance to execute their ultimate plan. So yes, this Queen Bee is now a super spy with an outfit to match that orchestrates the villain's downfall from the shadows before they even know what's happening. I think it would also be really cute if Queen Bee just calls everyone else in the team her worker bees and she bosses them around. I think that would be really in character for her. I think it would be a crime for me to make a Chloe revamp video without talking about Zoe Lee. Now, for some context, Zoe Lee is Chloe's half-sister that was introduced in season 4, who is the daughter of Audrey and some American dude. She was never mentioned or even hinted beforehand, which made her introduction and replacing of Chloe very sudden and, for some people, very upsetting. And personally, I don't think she should have ever been introduced into the show. See, as soon as Zoe showed up, Chloe's role as part of the French Miraculous superhero team was completely erased and any hope of her redemption is now completely non-existent. Because instead of using Zoe as a tool to help Chloe's growth, they did the exact opposite and used Chloe to develop Zoe. Like they're trying to erase Chloe from the show's roster of protagonists by filling her slot with someone else. This character erasure happens both from an in-universe and meta perspective. In-universe, the only times they'll mention or reference Queen Bee is when it involves Chloe being akumatized by Hawk Moth or when she's being remembered for her betrayal as opposed to the good she tried to do. I mean, the episode Queen Banana is literally about Zoe replacing Chloe's role in a film production. It's not exactly subtle. And from a meta perspective, well, just look at this poster! You're telling me that that spot shouldn't have gone to Chloe, the character that's been there since day one, that's heavily B-coded, but a completely new character we've never even seen before? 
the writers have gone out of their way to specifically exclude Chloe. And I don't know if it's because they're building up for her to be the next big bad villain to replace Hawk Moth, or because they just love having her around as a punching bag. Because if they wanted to redeem Chloe, I can tell you right now they would have already done so. She's been punished for her actions every single time she did something bad, but it was the show's deliberate choice to not have her learn from those experiences. It just implies that the show thinks if you're someone like Chloe, you're always gonna stay that way, so people should just give up on you. It's really sad to see the show itself treating Chloe the same way her mother treats her, in a blatantly toxic and emotionally abusive way. I'm not even a fan of Chloe, but I still think that the show for some reason treats her like this stigma in their story that they're desperately trying to wash their hands of. I just can't help but think the reason they did this was so that Marinette gets to work with only her friends and be surrounded by yes men, which first of all feels a lot like nepotism, and second of all, it's extremely unrealistic. You have to question what sort of message the show is trying to convey. Only work with people you like. If you don't like someone, don't try to make it work, just cut them out. Doesn't sound very educational and family friendly to me. A lot of the time, you don't get to pick who you work with in real life. If they'd kept Queen Bee, it would have taught Marinette that sometimes you have to work with people who are difficult or people you don't like because life won't always go your way. Because really, the only obstacle here is Marinette's emotional baggage toward Chloe. So the big lesson that she needs to learn is that she shouldn't take her feelings to work and learn some professionalism. Which mind you, is a prevalent issue in the show every time Chloe gets involved, and yet is never acknowledged. And yeah, Chloe's identity is public knowledge, but that never stopped Iron Man. And Chloe lives in a very secure hotel, and is wealthy enough to hire security guards to keep reporters and paparazzi away. And regarding the threat to her family? Well, Magical charms are a thing now, so she can just give those to the people close to her. Plus, Hawk Moth doesn't have any incentive to target Chloe personally because her Miraculous isn't the one he needs, and if she's firmly on Ladybug's side, it would be harder for him to convince her to help him because we've seen that she can resist his akumatization. While I was digging around for my context and information about Chloe, I actually found this interesting piece of concept art depicting Marinette, Alia, and Chloe together at a fashion show. Alia and Marinette are relatively consistent with who they are now, but Chloe is actually being nice to Marinette. It even looks like she's as much her friend as Alia is. So what I'm thinking is that this is another Felix situation, where Thomas decided to include the original character concept as a separate character in the show, which is the equivalent of Felix showing up and becoming the new cat noir while Adrian, I don't know, goes back to being homeschooled. And to be honest, Vesperia is just conceptually inferior to Queen Bee, because despite holding the Bee Miraculous, Vesperia is actually a wasp. Her name is a play on the word Vespidae, which is the scientific name for wasps. You can even see that Vesperia's stripe design matches wasps more closely than bees, and although they are related, they are not the same as bees. Bees are Anthophilas and belong to the superfamily of Apoidea, whereas wasps belong to the Vespoidea superfamily. From an everyday explanation, Bees are the helpful honey-making bugs that keep our ecosystem alive, and wasps are their parasitic cousins that take advantage of them by hijacking their beehive, stealing their honey, and eating their larvae until only they remain. Which I think is the perfect representation of Zoe's existence in the show. This is the final design. I hope you guys like it. She took a lot of work, but I was really happy with how she turned out. 
Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Make sure to follow me on all my social media because I post a lot of exclusive sneak peeks there. Check out my comic because that will make me really happy. And now, without further ado, here is Chloe's new transformation sequence. Goodbye! Colin, back